Hey everybody, I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with our weekly lecture, Great Players of the Past. Like a lot of our lectures, we're gonna hear dogs barking in the background, which is actually the best part of the lecture. And also, for reasons I can't explain, they're, they're actually, uh, uh, I can't think of his name, so I can't make this joke. They're, they're actually Levy's dogs. Gotham Chess, that's his name. Take two. So anyway, uh, Levy, keep control of your dogs there. Um, this lecture is on Jan Timon, <clears throat> who, I, who I know personally. Um, and um, we want to thank our sponsors, Peter Netten and Rick Goldschalk. Godschalk? Godschalk? I can't pronounce their names because they're probably Dutch. So if there's two kinds of names I can't pronounce, it's everybody else's and the Dutch. Anyway, thanks Peter and Rick um, for sponsoring the lecture. We have a lot of live people in the audience also. Um, Timon was probably, mm, was he at his peak then? We'll just say that he was because that makes for a better story. Jan Timon was around his peak when I lived in Europe. And actually, we both played for Anderlecht at the same time um, uh, in the Belgian league. He was board one. I don't know what board I was. I think I was board four. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. But this was in 1989, so I can't really remember what happened at that point because it was too long ago. Um, now, when you think of Dutch great players, there's three players you think of. Jan Timon, Max Erva, who was the world champion, pretty good, and Anish Giri. And if you'd like to, you could think of Luke Van Whaley, who was, you know, uh, probably the beginning of his career was near the end of Timon's best days. Sort of took over for Timon, I guess, as the best Dutch player. Um, now, now the Netherlands has a lot of good players, but okay, Geary's the best right now. And a funny story I have, which you won't find in any other lecture on Timon, um, because I have a lot of personal stuff. I was talking to these Dutch guys and they told me, this was when I lived in Belgium. They told me they were playing Trivial Pursuit in Dutch because Trivial Pursuit is in every language. And the question was, who is the greatest Dutch chess player of all time? And these guys are like IMs and GMs playing the game. So they said, oh, Max Erva, he was world chess champion. And the answer on the back was Jan Timon. So there you go. Even. Even Trivial Pursuit is tough when you're talking about Dutch chess players. So Timon, I would say, was one of the top 10 players in the world for, I don't know, at least 20 years. And his reign was between like 1975 and 1995. And currently he's 71 years old. He still plays chess occasionally, but very occasionally. Um, I can't even name the last tournament he was in, but I think he plays like one tournament a year, maybe. Um, and he's won every tournament. He's played matches with everybody. He's beaten everybody. And he did it for 20 years. And um, if you guys remember, and you don't, but if you remember, I mean, some of you weren't born yet, so you have a good reason for not remembering. There was a time in chess when Kasparov was supposed to play short for the World Chess Championship, and they didn't like what FIDE was doing, so they had their own match, Kasparov and Short, and they said, this is the World Championship, and FIDE said, no, it's not. <clears throat> so Kasparov was the World Champion, and he beat Short, and FIDE didn't recognize that match because it wasn't played under FIDE auspices. The guys didn't get their cut. They didn't get their payoffs. So they started having their own World Championship, and people argued who was the actual world champion. In the FIDE World Championship, they had all kinds of guys becoming world champion who most people don't recognize as world champion. And one of the matches was between Timon and Karpov. So Karpov at that point was the FIDE World Champion, although I mean, Grandmasters didn't really recognize Karpov as the world champion. And um, Timon lost that match. So he never became the FIDE World Champion, but he played for the FIDE World Championship. And uh, Timon's best tournament was actually uh, a rapid tournament. And I remember when it happened live, 
because it was in France, in Paris, I believe, and I was living uh, in, in Brussels, and it's right here. I'm, I'm highlighting the part of the Wikipedia article. I, I remember this tournament. It was a knockout tournament where you play, it's sort of like the World Cup. You play two games, and if it's 1-1, one, one, then you play quicker games. The difference is this tournament was a rapid tournament. So you played two games of rapid. There was no slow chess. Anyway, this tournament had all the best players in the world, and Timon knocked out Komsky, Karpov, Anand, and Kasparov in succession, won the tournament, and he didn't need any overtime. He just, in two games, he won all the matches. You can see that there. And probably, if you were to argue, because I was arguing this at the time, nobody listened to me, so I was sort of arguing with myself. That's why we have dogs, so I can argue with them. They don't listen either. Um, those were the four most talented players in the world. Kasparov, Karpov, Anand, and Komsky. Now, this was in 1991. And I remember a couple of things. One is how much money he won. My recollection, even though it was 1991, was he won 80,000 US. This thing says 75,000 US. So my memory's close. What it doesn't mention is the Dutch government took about half of it for tax purposes. So the Dutch government also won the tournament. Go the Dutch. Um, John Fontaine's entering again. Wow, he really likes this lecture. He's entered twice. Okay. <clears throat> so this, obviously as Wikipedia discusses his career, tells you about his great tournaments. Now, this is one of the few times I am going to totally diss Wikipedia's chess article. This article is very short compared to what it should be. This, this article should be pages long because Timon won every tournament and he was probably the best player in the West, which they don't talk about now, but in the 70s and 80s they did. In the 70s and 80s, try to mute yourself, John. In the 70s and 80s, um, there was the, the East and the West. And the East was Soviet Russia, Soviet Union, and some other Eastern European countries. And they always talked about who was the best in the West. Who was the best player that wasn't from the Soviet Union? And typically, in the late 70s and throughout the 80s, Timon was one of two or three names that you would mention as being the best player in the West. And he beat every, every world champion he played, he beat. He beat everybody. Um, and you can obviously look at his, at his career here on Wikipedia. Um, and I went to a lot of tournaments with Timon, but typically he was in a higher section than I was. I was in the doofus section and he was with the top players in the world. Okay, now let's go to the, to the games which are, which are more interesting. Okay. Now, the, the sponsors of the, of the lecture, they had two requests. One request I couldn't fill, and the other request I extra filled. So it, it, I balanced it out. Okay? And the one request I could fill was they said, for balance, would you show a game that he lost to Karpov? Because typically when you do a lecture, you talk about how great everybody is and how they won and they're better than everybody. We don't show their losses. It's not always true. Sometimes I show their losses anyway, but okay. And the other thing they requested was to show a game he played, the Dutch former world champion Max Erva, which I could not fulfill because they never played each other. However, Timon did write a book on Erva's best games, which you can purchase. I don't know where you can purchase, but you go to the internet, you can purchase it. And Timon, maybe even more so, I don't want to say more so because that's insulting to his play. But I'm going to say it anyway, because what are you going to do? You, you're going to put something in the chat, in the, in the comments, like, oh, Ben's stupid? I, I've heard that before. Some people would say, Timon is a better author and analyst than he is a chess player. Because his books are very, very highly regarded, and he's written many books. He has a lot of puzzles, many of which he invented. He is a puzzle maker. And he has excellent analysis such as the art of chess analysis, which a friend of mine once told me I could take the analysis from that book and do my own analysis and 
I wouldn't be able to improve on his analysis of the games. So Timon is known for excellent analysis. He's a funny guy, excellent author, fun to read, and very prolific. And obviously, if he was the best in the West, probably he's a better chess player than author, but he's a really good author. So if you have any books by Timon, <clears throat> they're very good. Now, luckily for the sponsors, because we must appease the sponsors, they must be appeased. They wanted to see a game that he lost to Karpov. And not only do I have a game he lost to Karpov, this is a famous game where I was actually at the tournament. Okay, and I was nine. I was nine years old. Let's see, there's a message. Right, now the message says, what about Timon's game against, against Nigel? Nigel Short's game against Timon, maybe Timon's most famous game, but he lost. So the truth hurts. And we've shown that game in several other lectures, including a lecture I did on short recently. So <clears throat> actually, I did a lecture three weeks ago on Alakine defense, and that game was featured. Okay, now this game, I, I'm sort of puzzled as to who to put at the bottom. I usually put the person who won and or the person I'm talking about on the bottom, but those are actually different people. So Karpov won this game. He had the black pieces and Timon's white. And I think I'm going to show Timon because, you know, he's, he's, uh, let's see, what is this? Poor guy, truth hurts. Okay. I can't read the chat anymore because it's, it's too chatty. Okay. Too many chatty Cathy's in the chat. All right. So this game was played in Montreal 79 and my dad decided to drive the family up to Montreal from Detroit. And we stopped in Toronto because my mom has relatives in Toronto. Well, Toronto's on the way to Montreal if you live in Detroit. So that cut the trip in half. We were in Montreal for three or four days. We watched the super tournament and then we drove home. And I was nine years old and I was rated 1100. And the players in the tournament were like Karpov, Spassky, Timon, uh, Kavalik, uh, I can name some more. I want to say Hort, but I'm not sure Hort played. So I won't say Hort. Um, and four other super GMs who's, I want to say Lubayevich also, but I'm not sure if he played, but I think so. Anyway, this tournament was famous because it was a super GM tournament and they didn't have a lot of those in the seventies. It was also famous because it's one of the first tournaments where Korshnoi was obviously blacklisted. Korshnoi defected in 1976, and when Soviet players played abroad, they insisted Korshnoi not be invited. And this was one of those tournaments where there were Soviet players playing, like Spassky and Karpov, and so no Korshnoi. And in this tournament, there was a spectacular victory from Bent Larson, who I think I didn't mention, but he played in the tournament, obviously. And he beat Karpov with the black pieces. And this was a spectacular victory from the tournament where Karpov won in 1979. That's when the tournament was played. And this is important to remember, and I've discussed this in other lectures. When you play for the World Chess Championship, which is very rare, I'm sure someday, someday trying to learn is going to play for the World but it's, it's rare. It's rare to play for the World Chess Championship. Very few people get to do it. And Karpov in 1978 and 1981, but this was before 81, so we're not going to talk about that. In 1978, Karpov played a match with Korshnoi, okay? And Karpov won that match, barely. And he was actually ahead 5-2, to two. then he lost three games out of four and was 5-5. Five, five. Then he won the last game and became world champion, retained his title. And in that match, Korshnoi would sometimes, previous to that match and during that match, play c4. So that's what Timon played, and Karpov had his preparation for Korshnoi, which he didn't use against Korshnoi because it didn't come up, then he gets to use it in later games. I've discussed this when I talk about Anand and Carlson. Okay? Anand and Carlson played a lot of world championship matches. They played other people, they played each other, and in those matches, they prepared for months for certain openings 
certain variations, certain positions, those positions didn't occur, but they still have the prep. Okay, and like the famous game Botvinnik played Fisher, they only played once. That was Botvinnik's preparation for Smyslov. It just didn't happen, but it happened against Fisher, and then Fisher refuted it over the board. And truth hurts. Okay, so this game, Karpov used some of his Korshnoi World Championship preparation that he didn't get to use against Korshnoi. So that work that you do, if it doesn't happen right away, it might happen in a year or five years or ten years, and you can play your analysis if you can remember it. Okay, so they played the Four Knights English. This can come with different, many different move orders, but they played this move order. And white played e3, and white can also play g3. I would say nowadays g3 is more common, but e3 is also played still. Okay, bishop e7, black can also play bishop b4. d4 takes, knight takes. Castles, and this is part of Karpov's preparation for Korshinoi. Knight c6, doubling the pawns. d5. And now black plays bishop d6, which loses a tempo, because black played bishop e7, then bishop d6. This is all theory. Black has a compromised pawn structure, but Karpov is actually hoping to get an attack against the white king, because white's pieces are for the most part, on the queen side. There's no knight on f3, okay, which would make black have no king side attack. So because of this, the bishop's heading this way, this bishop is, knight's coming to g4. And when Korshnoi played b3, Karpov, queen e7, bishop b2, and now he played the move d takes c4, which looks strategically terrible, and this was suggested to him by his coach Zayatsev, who was his main coach throughout his career, for his match with Korshnoi, but this position did not occur in the Korshnoi match, but Karpov remembered the analysis, and he remembered taking was an interesting move. Now, White played B takes C4, and you can see why he was wary of playing Bishop takes C4, which is positionally makes more sense. White has a better pawn structure, because now the bishop on e2 isn't defending g4 anymore. So not only could black play knight g4 and queen h4 and so forth, black could even consider bishop takes h2 check, knight g4 check. Of course, if you have analysis of this variation in preparation for a world championship match, that's better than figuring it out over the board. Over the board, Karpov wouldn't do this. Karpov's not sacking a piece and then hoping it works. But if it's preparation for world championship, and they've already analyzed it, okay, that's different. Now, obviously, if I play king g1, queen h4 is annoying, okay? And I'll let the engine sort out if this is good for black or not. Um, and if that's not good for black, then Timon might have been afraid of it, and Timon might also have been afraid of knight g4, not sacking a piece. So Timon played bc, which is safer, because... Now the bishop and the queen defend g4, so it's hard for black to play knight g4 and start an attack. Although, this gives white two isolated queenside pawns, which you'd hope to avoid when bishop takes c4. Karpov takes advantage of the open file, plays rook b8, attacking the bishop. Timon plays queen c1, defending the bishop. And we have more chat. This is the most chat we've ever had. Still theory. Um, yes, I think this position is still theory for Karpov, but not for Timon. And it's very risky when you play a long theoretical line as a world-class player like Timon against a fellow world-class player, but they have better analysis than you do. Okay, in this position, Karpov played knight g4, attacking the h2 pawn, not sacrificing anything and he played g3, he didn't want to give up the two bishops. Bishop takes g4 safer, but it gives black an excellent game. Black has great bishops. Black has a great rook on the open b file. Black still has an attack with queen h4 or queen e5 later. And that would have been a safer move, but then white has no chance of getting anything. White's just playing for equality. So he played the move g3, 
And now, if black's attack doesn't work, then black has these terrible queenside pawns. And Karpov is not really known for sacrificing pieces for an attack. He just doesn't do that. Now, unfortunately for Timon, if you have preparation where you prepare a sack and you and your coaches have analyzed it, that's different. Okay, then, then you can play for sacrifices. Okay, so Karpov played rook e8, putting more pressure, all these pressure points in, in white's position. The rook on f8, obviously not as good as on e8. Now there's all kinds of tricks we can do. Sometimes we sacrifice the exchange and the queen is overworked. So white has to be careful about his kingside pawns. And he played the move knight d1. That's the safest move he could find. It's not an aggressive move, but it defends the bishop, defends the e-pawn, defends the f-pawn, and it opens up my bishop. So it looks really safe. So Timon played a really safe move, and Karpov played knight takes h2, which is shocking because that's not really a Karpov-type move, but he sort of knew that it would work. Okay, and Timon didn't take the knight. Timon played c5 attacking the bishop. And that's because Timon missed something in his calculation. Okay, so if you play king takes knight, queen h4 check, um, you can't take the queen, the computer won't let me, because you're in check. Uh, it doesn't matter if you play king g1 or king g2, it's going to be the same thing, because if you play king g2, I'm going to check you here. You're not going to play king f3, because checkmate is better for black. So you're going to play king g1, and I'm going to sacrifice here. Now... If you would play king g1 right away, I also sacrifice here. Same thing's going to happen. You'll take, I'll take with check, king h1, and now black can play the move rook e6, threatening rook h6 checkmate. White's pieces are not really in a good place to defend against black's threats. Okay, so black is winning, and Timon saw knight takes h2, and he thought c5 would be his savior. And the reason is, if you play bishop takes c5, and I play king h2, that's the end of your attack. You can't play queen h4 check, because your bishop's not on d6. You're just hanging your queen. Okay, so Timon thought, I'll play c5, and he said, black has to play knight takes f1. And he was right. Knight takes f1. And Timon said, I'm going to take the bishop, attacking Karpov's queen. Karpov's going to do something about it. Probably queen takes or pawn takes. Then I'm going to play bishop takes f1, and my position's fine. I have two pieces for a rook and two pawns, and the attack is over. And Karpov made the move that Timon overlooked. Overlooking one move in a tactical position like this can spell disaster. And that's what happened Karpov played, knight takes g3. And Timon didn't see that when he allowed knight takes h2. And the idea is, if you take this knight, which he did, your king is just totally destroyed, as opposed to when you have this nice pawn structure. And if you take the queen, I take the bishop with check, and then I take the queen, and blacks up a lot of material. Exchange in two pawns, three pawns, I don't know. Okay, way, way too much material. So Timon missed knight takes g3, and then his king went on a king hunt. And in this tournament, there weren't a ton of decisive games because all of the players were, you know, top in the world. So there was a lot of draws. So winning with the black pieces in a scintillating attack wasn't something you would expect from Karpov. I just remembered somebody else who played in the tournament, Mikhail Tal, because Tal and Karpov tied for first. So I eventually remember everybody, but it takes me a while. Okay, now this position, black has a rook and three pawns for bishop and a knight, but that doesn't matter. What matters is white's king safety. White has no king safety. White's king is forever going to be bad. So he tried to defend, defended his g-pawn. Now queen h2 is coming, and it did. He's chasing Timon's king into the center. Queen g2, pinning the bishop. Now black's threatening either bishop a6 or bishop g4. 
Knight b2, bishop a6, threatening the bishop. Knight d3, take, you can't take with the bishop, it's pinned. Take with the king, nice and safe. Rook d8, and you can see white's king is not, there's good and there's not good, that's not good. Always play bishop f1, check, king c3, c5, takes, queen c6, king b3, king is going for a walk, check, king a3, rook e5, and I believe Simon resigned here. Oh, he didn't resign, he played bishop e4. It shows you what I know. Queen b6, okay, now he resigned. Now we're threatening, queen takes b4 mate, rook takes e3 check, queen takes e3 check, and rook a5 check. And, and technically black has a head material here. And so Timon resigned, and this was one of the most famous games from Montreal 79, and one of the reasons is Karpov didn't play in Karpov kind of fashion. Karpov sacking material, long lasting attack, Timon's king running around. That's more like Kasparov, but Kasparov in 1979 was only 16 years old. I never even heard of him. So that wasn't a Karpov-like game, but that was Karpov's most famous game from that event. Okay, and so Timon lost to Karpov. Karpov was the reigning world champion. Timon has beaten Karpov before, and he will again. I don't know if he will again. They're actually the same age. So if they have some tournament for the old timers, maybe you'll beat him again. Okay, and then let me get this out of the way. Okay, and the next game is against Gary Kasparov, and this was played in 1985 when Kasparov was the world champion. So Timon only plays world champions, just like we do. But he plays them when they're the reigning world champion. I've played world champions but it was a thousand years before they were world champion. And by world champions, I mean I played Anand. And I played Anand when he was a kid, okay? I played Karawana when he was a kid. Always play them when they're a kid. When they're actually the, like top in the world, then don't, don't play them anymore. Okay, Timon has white. And this is a very strange game. And the reason it's strange is Kasparov plays like Karpov. Okay, Kasparov, playing black and a Rui Lopez. I'm sure, for psychological reasons, Kasparov would want to have white in this game. Okay, Timon played like Kasparov, and Kasparov played like Karpov. But Kasparov's not Karpov. So Kasparov playing black in a closed Rui? I, I, unheard of, except, you know, it happens. Okay, so they played a million moves of theory, as was the style at the time. Okay, and what's funny is, the line that Kasparov played most often is also named after Zayatsev, the Zayatsev variation. And Zayatsev was the one who showed Karpov how to play the last opening against Timon, but against Korshinoi. So basically, Timon keeps fighting against world champions who have help with Zayatsev. Very strange. And he played bishop b7. And what black wants to do is put pressure on e4 before white can play d4, knight d2, knight f1, knight g3. If white plays knight f1 in that sequence I showed you, he has to have e4 protected sufficiently. The purpose of this opening is to stop white from doing that. Okay, so d4, rook e8, and if you're a super grandmaster, and if you are, you're not watching this video, maybe somebody told Simon, Feingl did a video on you, do you want to watch it? And then he said no, but they misheard him. They were like, oh, Jan must have said yes, let's watch it. Then Jan's watching the video. But if they had heard him, they would have said, no, I don't want to watch that. Okay, and if, you, if you're a super grandmaster, this is the beginning of a lot of draws. This is a super grandmaster draw that is very well known. White plays knight g5, attacking the f7 pawn. Notice f7 is attacked twice. Black plays rook f8. White plays knight f3, black plays rook e8, and they repeat. Always repeat. Okay? And if the players don't want to play, they play this repetition, and the game is drawn by repetition. Or if it's a super GM, by reputation. Timon didn't want to draw, he just wanted to get closer to the time control. And Timon played knight bd2, which gives black the opportunity to play bishop f8. Okay, 
And as I said earlier, the point of this system for black invented by Zayatsev is to pressure the e4 pawn. So if you play knight f1, knight g3 in typical Rui Lopez fashion, it doesn't work. Because after knight f1, I take on d4, and e4 is not sufficiently protected. Now, before the Zayatsev was invented, uh, there was something called the Smyslov variation. The Smyslov variation, invented by Smyslov, was invented to stop knight g5, and then Zayatsev said, why are we stopping knight g5? So Smyslov played h6, knight bd2, rook e8, knight f1, and now you don't have pressure on e4. You play bishop f8, and I'm just in time, knight g3. And Zayatsev said, why are we playing h6? Let's just play rook e8 right away. If they play knight g5, I'll go back. Why is the knight on g5? Okay, so the Zayatsev variation was born, and Karpov played it his whole career, especially against Kasparov. Now Kasparov is playing against Timon. So as I said, white can't play knight f1, so he played a3, a boring move. Good, good. h6, now we can play h6. Still can't play knight f1. Bishop c2, defending e4. Now we can play knight f1. And the reason Timon played a3 is if black trades on d4, he can't play knight b4 attacking the bishop. If the pawn was on a2, he probably would. Then he would play c5 and bust out. Okay, so bishop c2. And he plays knight b8, the Breyer variation. Very important if you want ice cream. Okay, that's not the haagen variation. And the knight goes to b8 to d7, and typically not this move order, but he's still playing knight b8 to d7. The bishop puts pressure on e4, and the knight on d7 is good, not blocking the bishop, so the c-pawn can move if necessary. b4, gaining space, knight bd7, bishop b2. And not only is this one of Timon's best games, and this is actually the game that's highlighted in his Wikipedia article, beating the reigning world champion. But I'm sure it's a position where Karpov, I'm sorry, Kasparov, wanted to say, excuse me, can I have white? Because this is more a Kasparov position with white than with black. Okay, g6. Timon played c4, putting all of his pawns on the fourth rank. Ed, cb5, ab5, knight d4. Material still equal. But now black has a very weak pawn on b5, and white's pawn on e4 is also weak, but at least he defended it three times. Black doesn't want to play c6, because that blocks his bishop on b7. Black also doesn't want to lose this pawn. So you tell me what to do. Okay, Kasparov did play c6, blocking his bishop. a4, attacking the pawn again. Now he attacks the c6 pawn. Queen b6, defending and attacking. Knight c2, defending. Queen goes back to c7. Otherwise, white was going to play knight c4 with tempo. Bishop b3. And you see Timon played bishop b5, bishop a4, bishop b3, bishop c2, bishop a4, bishop b3. And the bishop stands pretty well on b3 now. Now that all that mess has been taken out of the way and the e-pawn is defended, the bishop can go to a great square. Bishop a6, that looks a little suspicious to me. Rook c1, lining up with the queen. Bishop g7, knight e3. Now we're really lined up with the queen. Bishop b5, very defensive. And knight d5. A brilliant tactic, seeing pawn takes knight, rook takes queen. That's not that brilliant, okay? But there's a lot of tactics in the position and a lot of trades. Black played knight takes d5. White played bishop takes g7. Black took, white took. Material's equal, but this is very annoying. This is a very tough defense for black. Knight e5, defending his c6 pawn. Knight e4, excellent move. Both sides have excellent knights in the center. Knight d3, and this is very tactical. 
Obviously, Kasparov is threatening knight d3, attacking both rooks. And Timon plays knight e4, and he says, yeah, yeah, knight d3, I don't care about that. And one great thing about Timon was his calculating ability, and he trusted himself. He wasn't afraid of his opponent. And of all the super grandmasters who weren't world champions in the 70s and 80s, the least scared was Timon. Timon was the one who wanted to put fear in you. And after knight d3, Timon played queen to d2, allowing black to take the rook, but you can see with the dark squared bishop trade, queen c3 check is going to be quite annoying. So Timon was sacrificing the exchange before I was saying how great it was. Wait, 1985? Yeah, I wasn't saying it yet. Rook a3, attacking the bishop on b3. And he played the move knight f6, a brilliant move. Incredibly well calculated. Now, of course, if you ever let me play knight e8 check, that wins all of black's pieces. So black, black can't allow that. Black's never allowing that. Okay, but, okay, that's a big threat. So he plays rookie one check, rookie one. Once again, this is a huge threat, knight e8 check. So he plays king takes knight. Queen c3 check. What are you going to do about your king? Well, you can move your king up the board, which is very dangerous, or you can block with knight e5. Okay, they both lose, but Kasparov chose knight e5. Looks like black is safe, and Timon plays f4. So white's down a piece, but obviously he's getting it back, and black's king is no good. Bishop a4. Takes, takes. Now this bishop is pinned. It looks like Timon's in trouble on the queen side. And now this is, this is a move I really like this game. D6. And I think that's what Kasparov overlooked. After D6, it's an obvious interference. It threatens the move you like, pawn takes queen. I see why you like that. And it also threatens the move I like, queen takes E5, checkmate. What it also does is it unleashes the bishop on f7 <clears throat> and your queen's defending f7. But first things first, you can't allow pawn takes queen, you can't allow queen takes pawn. So you have to play queen takes d6. Queen f3 check, now your queen on c7 isn't defending the pawn on f7 anymore. Queen takes f7, and now we see double and triple pins. It's going to be pindemonium. Timon plays rook d1, pinning the queen to the king. And Kasparov plays rook a1, confusing the audience. And the idea is, if you take the rook, I play queen d4 check, and I get my rook back. And then black is up a pawn. And Timon said, you will know my name is the Lord. And pause your video if you're watching on YouTube and try to find the move Timon played. After the move Timon played, Kasparov resigned. And there's two moves that win immediately. But Timon played the cooler one. The other one's slightly less cool. Slightly. Okay, and the answer is, obviously, queen f6 check. And everybody's pinned. The queen's pinned, the rook's pinned. Now, many years ago, a chess player in Georgia asked me, he was a tournament player, he was 1700, he said, in this kind of position, can I do this? And I said, no, because you're in check. And his response was, the rook is pinned, so the rook can't move, so I'm not in check. Now, that's not the stupidest argument I've ever heard, but it's still wrong. Okay, Wh whoever takes whoever is king first, that's who's in check. So the computer won't let me do that. And obviously, Timon could have also played queen f8 check, which I find less appealing. I'm not sure why. This just seems more appealing to me. And after queen f6 check, Kasparov resigned, and Timon tactically outplayed Kasparov, which in 85 wasn't something you saw very often. And you could see the confidence in Timon's play 
because he could have repeated and drawn the game in the opening with knight g5, knight f3, but with the white pieces, he's playing for a win. And against lesser grandmasters, also with the black pieces. Okay, last but not least, although it's hard to beat, you know, Kasparov and... Okay, now this is the revenge game I wanted to show you. Let me make sure. Yes. Okay, this was played in 1990. The first game was played in 79. The next game was played in 85. And obviously, as somebody pointed out, who's in the live audience, they said, short Timon. Shorts king walks up the board, go short. Okay, not really a game you want to show in a Timon lecture. That's more of a short lecture. Well, Timon also beat short many games, and this is one of them. So short likes to play the Dutch and the French. He plays e6, plays the Dutch. Timon likes to play against the Dutch. Timon likes to have the white pieces against the Dutch, probably because he's Dutch. Okay, and Timon plays the move b3. He wants to play bishop a3 and trade off the dark squared bishops and leave black with this silly bishop on c8. Bishop d7, short wants to play bishop e8, bishop h5. Typical Dutch stuff, bishop a3. A5, he wants to put something on b4. So he trades bishops first before black gets a chance to play knight b4 and prevent it. Knight c3. The bishop comes around to h5. Okay, now short plays dc, which to me is strategically inferior. And probably he wanted to avoid a queen trade that white could play with cd. Then white just has the better bishop. This bishop isn't very good. Typically in the Dutch, with black playing f5, black's playing for a kingside attack. Black plays knight e4, and g5, and h5, and bishop h5, and rook f6, and so forth. But if the queens are traded, white just has a better endgame because black has a bad bishop on e8. So short trades on c4, I'm not a big fan of that. Rook d8, rook d1, knight g4 attacking the queen on e3. Timon moves it away. Bishop f7, strange square for the bishop. Rook b1, attacking the b7 pawn. And he plays e5. So Nigel played bishop f7 so he could get his bishop attacking the c4 pawn. And he's counterattacking white's play on the flank by playing in the center. Timon takes. Rook takes d1. Rook takes d1. Short got rid of the pressure on his b pawn. Queen c5, threatening everything. Queen c4, bishop c4, or either knight to e5. So black's down a pawn, and black's also threatening queen f2 and knight f2. So black has like 10 threats in this position. Okay, so Nigel's getting counterplay. Knight g5, the queen defends f2 by discovery, discovered defense. The bishop is unleashed and I'm going to take your bishop on f7. Or I'll play queen f5, threatening queen h7 mate and the knight. So knight g5 is an excellent move, probably underestimated by short. Bishop c4, saving his bishop. Knight to d5. White's pieces are very active in the center. Knight to d8, defending the e6 square. Notice the knight is blocking the bishop, so white wants to play knight e6. Forking the queen and rook. Knight d8 defending. e6. White's threatening e7. Winning the game immediately. Bishop takes knight. Getting rid of the knight that defends e7. Rook takes. Obviously white's crashing through. Black has no counterplay. Black has a weak pawn on c7. Weak pawn on f5. Weak pawn on a5. Queen's attacked. The knight... E7 is coming. The black king is getting attacked on the diagonal because black's white square bishop is gone. So the game didn't last very long. Nigel can't play a back rank check because that's defended by the queen. So he plays queen a3, trying to get some counterplay on the queen side. Are, are you kidding me? Rook d7, threatening e7. See, the game you know is the game short wins by walking his king up. What about the game Tim on one where he just rolls over short because short played the Dutch? Yeah. Played the Dutch against a Dutch person. 
knight c6, trying to stop e7. Bishop takes knight. Now the king has luft, and we've gotten rid of the defense of the e7 square. Now, normally, black would resign here, but short has a good sense of humor. Okay, don't tell people on Twitter that, but short has a sense of humor. <clears throat> Instead of resigning, he lets himself get checkmated. And a lot of amateur players would prefer if the super GM stopped resigning and start getting checkmated. Guy resigns, and you're like, why did he resign? I would never resign here. Why did he resign? Okay, well, Short didn't resign. So now you're going to see why he could have resigned. So after e7, every grandmaster in the world would, res would resign here. Because I'm threatening pawn takes rook. And when you stop pawn takes rook, we play queen c4 check. So every grandmaster in the world resigns here. And ch Short just played till mate. Rook e8, queen c4 check. And we get to see our favorite mate. Knight h6, double check. The king is in check by two pieces. King h8, queen g8 check, and knight f7 mate. Now, you've seen that in puzzles, but have you seen it in a super GM game? No. And the reason you haven't seen it is before it happens, people resign. So when it's going to happen, the other guy resigns. Or the other guy sees it's going to happen, doesn't let it happen. Avoids it. But Short couldn't do either one, so Timon just rolled him over, checkmated him, sacked his queen, advanced in the center, and total domination. So Timon, a great player, he beat a lot of super GMs and world champions, a very common thing for him to do. Um, I could lecture for hours on Timon's best games. He has dozens and dozens of games where he beats players over 2,600. Okay, these are three of my favorites because he's playing a world champion, he's playing another world champion, and he gets revenge against Short. Um, somebody asked a very good question, how does Jordan von Forest compare? Well, he doesn't. Okay, von Forest, not as good as Geary. So von Forest is the second best player in, in Holland right now. Um, but I wouldn't put von Forest in the top 20 in the world. And I would say Timon was top 10 in the world for 20 years. So, like a level down. Von Forest a level down. Okay, Lucas Von Forest, even another level. That's Jordan's brother, who's also very good. So I want to thank our sponsors again, Peter and Rick. Thanks for sponsoring the lecture. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact Karen, Karen at ATLChessClub.com. Go Jan Timon, and hopefully we'll have more great players of the past, and a lot of them... Still play chess, just not, not quite as good. All right, see you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.